Hi guys, uh, welcome to this edition of the Axis webinar. Um, unfortunately, we're doing another one, which is uh, not great news for anyone. Um, just going to wait a little minute or two while people join and, uh, and then we'll get started. So um, we've got Dan live from his living room. Um, yeah, we've got Simon uh, fresh from the operating room in his scrubs. And uh, I'm not sure, where are you, Simon? You're, you're sort of looking like you're maybe in some sort of lounge area. Yeah, that's correct. I'm in my lounge. Good. Um, I, and I am uh, in my shed in the garden. So we've all got a lockdown story as a miner that are supposed to be moving house. And so you'll be able to see all my boxes and things behind me that may or may not at some stage be moved into a new house. Um, we'll see how we go. Um, so uh, I'm very aware that this is uh, is something called a mannel, which is to be avoided at all costs. So it's a panel with all men. Um, so as a, a kind of concession to that, next week we're going to do another webinar, assuming we're all working out of our living rooms again. Um, and we're going to create a, a, a wannel or a wommel or something like that with, um, with three women speakers. So uh, we'll have Colleen Wynn Stanley, who'll be here. Um, live from the Gold Coast, where she is with the Warriors. She's currently stranded in some fancy hotel over in the Gold Coast, so there's worse places to be stuck, but stuck she is. Um, we'll also have Julie Shamlay, who's going to talk a bit about dancing. Um, I think proper dancing, rather than the stuff we've been doing at home with our kids. Um, and Sarah B was going to talk a little bit, a fennel. Maybe it's a fennel. I think it's a fennel. Fennel. So, I don't know, from the chat. I was also very excited to see that we've got a follower from Turkey. So um, big shout out to Omar, who uh, said that this is one of the best things about lockdown um, is the, the Axis webinar. So it looks like we've got a reasonably solid number of participants. So we might crack on. Um, the, the vibe today is supposed to be a little bit uh, more low key than perhaps uh, a, a kind of standard medical conference. So um, I've got the Q&A up over here. So if anyone wants to fire through some questions, um, please feel free to do so. Um, but kind of the, the plan for tonight is to kind of keep it to a pretty tight hour. If there's some extra questions beyond that, then uh, all good. Um, but it, I guess we'll kick off with you, Simon. You're gonna, you've obviously just come back from the Olympics, which sounds like it would have been um, a really interesting life experience uh, for a variety of reasons. So um, I guess I'll hand over to you and, and interrupt you as I see fit. Cool. Thanks, Mark. Uh, yeah, I'm aware of this sort of being one of those slideshows that your grandmother forced you to watch. And so please add to the banter if you can, if it feels that way. Uh, all right. Okay, that's me. So yeah, um, obviously I uh, work several days a week at Axis and my other job is uh, the medical director for the men's hockey for high performance sport. Um, this slide sort of is probably the most boring but symbolizes I guess the most important stuff of the trip so COVID is the reason we're all here uh, it cancelled the Olympics last year uh, and then rightly or wrongly has uh, just gone ahead but the reality is is that COVID uh, made it a significant challenge uh, for everyone involved um, but particularly from New Zealand's end because of the approach we're taking uh, there was a significant amount of logistics involved. Uh, and so we didn't get there without a lot of uh, manpower uh, and expertise and help from a number of people, including uh, the NZOC, High Performance Sport, all the NSOs were significantly involved, and even sort of higher levels through MB. And uh, I guess that next picture on the right sort of symbolizes that. It was the key process for me, I guess, firstly, feeling safe. Uh, and it was the, the first point in the journey knowing that, okay, this is something that I'm going to do now. <clears throat> so having two vaccines was key. And uh, I guess it's a good segue to say if you haven't uh, booked yours yet, then get amongst it. It's, uh, it's so important. So did, did everyone know that you can get your vaccine? There's a bunch of walk-up stations. There's one new by the, the airport. We've been sending a bunch of patients out there. So if you fancy getting a vaccine... Um, the park and ride out the hospital apparently the more people you have in your bubble in your car the faster you get a vaccine so um, if you fancy it then um, that's an option yeah it's a no-brainer no-brainer it was, it was uh, fundamental for us going 
Uh, this next uh, slide is pretty kind of common, I guess, if you if you tour with athletes. Uh, you know, there's a bunch of people, a bunch of gear standing in line. For me, it signifies the beginning of a very long uh, few weeks. It was the first of many queues. Uh, it was also the first, um, well, sorry, the last period where we weren't uh, wearing masks for the majority of time. Uh, so there was a bit of mask freedom there. We went via Singapore, uh, which is obviously 12 hours, and we had a sort of a, a, an isolated stop off there for several hours before the six and a bit hour flight to Narita. We then had six hours of processing in Japan uh, before the hour long journey to the Olympic Village. So it was a, a massive day. It was all going relatively smoothly. We're about to get on the bus as well. Then one of the athletes provided an adequate sample of their uh, saliva test and so we all had to sit in this windowless room for an extra few hours so it really just signifies the start of many queues and a lot of processes uh, that took place for us to get there um, cool this is obviously arriving uh, if you've been in an olympic scenario before this uh, won't be that new it was it was my first experience uh, it was one of many hackers uh, the first one that was directed at me and then I as a privileged white male was able to sort of sneak my way from the back further up the front as I grew in confidence um, it's pretty hard to put into word the, the, the feeling that you get and um, both with this welcome but also uh, the, the team spirit it encompasses it, it's pretty cool and every time an athlete arrived they'll get this every time they meddled they would get this and you can imagine the crew got bigger and bigger and as the Olympics wore on the feelings uh, sort of improved as, as, as we approached the Olympics basically we were on our own and so this had even more meaning it also served as sort of our orientation it was a bit of a chance to go through the medical protocols um, and go through the, the team in Akitanga, which is basically the, the NZOC values, uh, which includes a lot of sort of attitudes and behaviors as well as the medical protocols. Uh, this is a view from the seventh floor. So hockey was on floor six and seven of the New Zealand apartment. We were lucky enough to secure half an apartment with our own elevators. So it meant there was a low chance of contamination. Uh, we had all 12 floors. Um, you can see on that screen there, it's pretty, pretty cool evenings. They're hot, um, but nice. The big flat um, area bottom right is the dining hall where all the action happens. Th that was disappointing, I have to say, again, because of the, the, the protocols that we had to put in place. Most other countries were pretty poor at masking and physical distancing, um, but we had to get in and get out and not take selfies with those athletes and not meet your heroes. Um, so that was that was a bit of a shame. Those little uh, white tents, that's the beginning of the transport area. Uh, that big building just behind that, that includes the polyclinic, which is like a mini hospital with a bunch of specialists, MRI scanner, CT scanners, and all the imaging you need. Uh, there's the athlete gym and the athlete leisure center, which we were barred from going to because of the, the COVID risk. And we actually wanted to avoid the polyclinic at all costs. I think actually, though, the only athletes that ended up there were hockey players, unfortunately, uh, which we can talk about in other slides. You might be able to see in the middle of the screen, there's some white prefab buildings. That's the saliva testing station, obviously an afterthought um, for the village. So they're dunked right down next to the, the uh, roadway with all the flags on it. So Simon, just did you get the sense that the world had moved on from COVID? Like, were we the only ones sneaking around wearing masks and, and being careful? Or um... uh, So masks were mandatory, um, but it was poorly managed. So there were a lot of noses out or, you know, masks down uh, around their necks. Uh, there was a lot of banter outside the dining hall without masks on and definitely not a lot of physical distancing. So it was, it was pretty obvious that us and the Australians were the, the teams making the most effort. Cool. Hey, and just remember to everyone that if you do have questions, let's try and use the Q&A. So if you look down the bottom, there's a Q&A um, button. Um, the chat works fine, but um, if you go Q&A, we can share that more widely. So um, have a look at that. Yeah, the rest of our building, which we haven't got pictures of, obviously we had an apartment set up. So there were four single rooms, which was quite nice for a change. So I got my own room. There were two doubles and then you had a little communal area. You were only allowed out of your masks when you're in your room, so. Um, Did you jump up and down on your cardboard bed? 
Uh, I didn't because uh, it was the only bet I had, uh, but that was quite a common theme. It was pretty hard. I, I think it would have sustained my big frame anyway, jumping on it. It was, it was pretty solid. Cool. Boring photo, but this really sums up a lot of my work, to be honest. So in the top right hand Collecting corner, you can this. see the thermometer. Uh, and then there's 21 um, saliva vials there. So we tested every day. There were 52 uh, hockey personnel that needed testing. And every morning before eight, it would piss me off as I would have to wake up athletes or tell this person to do it every single day. Um, and then it's running up and down stairs to make sure you get them in time for the pickup. Um, uh, alongside that, they had to do an online health check. There was a specific app that we had to download. And that was, wasn't worth the uh, technology that was used to design it because out of all the uh, presentations with respiratory symptoms, none of them entered anything positive on the app. Uh, they were picked up by me and the physio, just as an aside. So what it tells you is that athletes or staff, if they uh, have a runny nose at the Olympics, they're not going to say anything about it. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of logistics involved in those saliva tests. They were, in my opinion, significantly important, particularly from New Zealand team. So we knew that every day when those tests were done to a, a reasonable degree of accuracy, that we could say that our team didn't have COVID. There was no guarantees that other teams were doing it. So we, we couldn't say for sure if that was happening. Uh, but for us to manage our own bubble, uh, it, was, it was good. A and I guess on that note, from a COVID perspective, you know, every New Zealand athlete and staff member now has gone through MIQ, I believe, uh, coming out today. And so far, there's been no COVID, which is, which is a win. Um, in the village, it was, it was increasing slowly, but it never exponentially got out of control. Uh, towards the end of it, there was probably about 40 to 50 Japanese contractors every day. So they were indirectly involved that were getting COVID. There was usually about five to 10 non-athlete staff. So they were in the village and then somewhere between one and five athletes a day that were getting it. Um, so it was real, but it never took off, which is a good thing. Um, there were a couple of athletes through no fault of their own who were sitting on a, an airplane uh, that unfortunately were treated as close contacts and that had a significant impact on the uh, Olympics. Um, this is just a picture of the setup. It's the physio room. Me and the physio sat there, to be fair, the physio spent most of the time here. Um, you know, it's a usual cramped space where you chuck everything in. It was, it was where I would check uh, for the negative tests the next morning at 6.05 a.m. every day. And that's where I paid for my trip, basically, as in three days out from departing, despite them doing the tests, we had eight saliva tests that were missing. And so we had to scramble in order to get our tests so that we could leave um, done in time. So I feel that checking every day was enough for me to, to warrant being on the trip because I was able to pick that up and those uh, seven people were able to come home uh, when they were supposed to as well. I guess the best thing about that spot, as you can see, you're looking out over the front of the dining hall. And so there was lots of people watching. I saw uh, Novak Djokovic, Luka Doncic, Nigel Houston, oh, the list goes on. Most of them taking selfies with other countries out there. You know you're working, actually, Simon. <laughs> That's right. Fanboy. Yep. <laughs> um, who, who were you working with? Who was the, the hockey physio? Uh, so I worked across both men and women. So we had uh, Gabby, Gabby McCulloch and Ben Park was the men's. Cool. Yeah. Both worked very hard. We're awesome. Easy to get, get on with. Um, did an amazing job. Both had a number of challenges, which if we have time, we can talk about. This is basically a picture of my um, setup before I went out each day for training. Uh, that little backpack has the AED in it, but also my computer and Kindle, because if there was doping control or someone got sick, it invariably meant you're sitting around for hours. Mm. Uh, pretty quite, standard medical quite, kit. Quite brave of you wearing a singlet with your frame. Yeah, no. Oh, this is one thing. I kind of shredded up quite a lot. That's the other <laughs> thing. I'll show you, I'll show you the, the next photo. So there I am in front. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're basically as a doctor a glorified roadie that, that is dj forbes you no it's not that's me i've just with your big arm sleeve yeah okay <laughs> um are you impressed so, with my tattoo knowledge yeah no yeah. that is dj forbes you're correct um so there's a couple of reasons to that photo one yeah it is as a doctor you do a lot of lifting and pushing but also from a heat perspective, it was super hot and we had internal thermometers on a few of the guys and, and it was an 800 meter walk to the bus. 
And so their temperature would go up a whole degree on that walk to the bus. Where, where um, was the internal thermometer? So they swallowed it. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but that was, you know, so there's uh, a chili bin full of slushies. There's a couple of chili bins full of ice vests. Uh, there's the made up electrolytes and water and then part of the other gear. And it was basically to, to design, uh, designed to save the other guys having to lug too much stuff as well as to manage their cooling. Uh, it's part of the heat process as well. So um, we had one game where heat protocol came into play. Uh, there were definitely uh, games in the semifinals for the men and women where the full heat protocols came into play. So if it was above 35 degrees, you got two minutes per quarter. Uh, and if there was it was about 42 or if uh, there was associated high humidity, um, they would have a seven and a half minute break as well. And we routinely played in above 35 and routinely had humidity above 80. It was really hot. No, but just using ambient temperature it wasn't a... I know that that um, has the ability to check humidity and it gives you a wet bowl, but it also gives you a heat index. And so, yeah, heat index was getting up to 40. Um, I can't remember what the wet bulbs were, but uh, they were they were pretty impressive, some of them. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, heat was a big factor for the Olympics. We worked on that pretty hard before we left. Um, there was you know, heat acclimatization stuff. There was a bunch of protocols set in place. Um, when we were there, we had pre-cooling slushies, ice fest. We had uh, a bunch of stuff in the sidelines and, and stuff afterwards. But despite that, we had two athletes who, who developed heat illness. It was, it was probably... One of them was, well, both of them were through no fault of their own. One of them was during doping controls. So they didn't have adequate separation from the public and COVID risks. So this poor athlete had to go sit outside in the blazing sun for two hours before they got their ride home. And the other one was an athlete who had an UTI before she left. And then I just think knocked her around a little bit. Uh, and both of them suffered with fatigue, vomiting, uh, and it affected their performance. They weren't super sick with it, but it certainly had an impact on their performance. Uh, is, uh, it's not a very clear photo and it may look a little bit uh, unusual with one of the boys doing some uh, some gum work in the middle there. But basically that was one of the changing rooms. Uh, it was fully aircon. There was an ice bath in the back there, but it was pretty tight. But also we developed a modified um, in changing room warm up to minimize time on the turf. And uh, the jury's out, I guess, whether that was successful. You can see one of the boys there has his uh, ice vest on as well. Uh, some of them being good and wearing their masks and changing room as well, which was optional. Um, yeah, uh, this, this is what it was all about. Uh, obviously, this was uh, a big game for us. Uh, it didn't go as we had planned, but we pushed the Aussies uh, pretty close in the end. I guess from an overall campaign, it was relatively disappointing. We, um, uh, we had went out earlier than we had hoped, and that created some challenges. We also had three hamstring injuries in a single tournament, all of them essentially uh, tournament ending. Um, and so that'll require a little bit of a review as to why. Um, we've got some theories that are going. We also had another adductor injury. We had two relatively reasonable head injuries. Um, and then there's all the kind of stuff that goes in for the athletes um, when, when you go out as well. We had uh, one confirmed retirement. A lot of athletes are considering it. There's a bunch of athletes that have put a lot of work in to be there, so they're pretty disappointed. And what I meant for us is that we were stuck there for another week without anything official to do, which meant there were challenges in promoting the, you know, the hygiene protocols, um, you know, managing things like access to partying and getting out and doing things you shouldn't. You may have heard what some of the, the hockey roos or the, or the kookaburras did. Um, yeah, so it was it was it was difficult not doing as well as we would like, and I guess everyone goes there always wants to meddle and so it leaves a I guess a, a feeling of unfinished business for me anyway this really epitomizes I guess that period afterwards though um it's uh I guess the New Zealand team uh, hunkering down and supporting all the other athletes and so you couldn't go to the games uh it was pretty hard to maintain our distancing there but everyone's got their masks on well, most people I can see one actually doesn't um they were supporting their, uh, the Sevens women. They won their gold medal then. It's a pretty cool vibe. Obviously, the whole team gets together. And from people that have been to a number of Olympics, they actually felt that this one had a better feeling because people couldn't disappear after they had completed uh, things. They had to sort of celebrate within the village environment and within the safety of the um, accommodation. And so there was, a, there was a pretty cool vibe there uh, at that time.
there's my last picture. Um, I've just rushed them quickly at the end to get through um, my 20 minutes, but obviously the obligatory Olympic rings. Uh, that was a, just a, a final walk in the evening by myself to get that, so I didn't have the guts to ask someone else to, to get me in the, the shot. So that's me. Nice one. So um, maybe we'll just can your slides. Um, and that's good. So the uh, there's one question from uh, Chris Milne, who obviously has been to a few Olympic Games himself, um, asking about how you got by when you didn't want to go to the poly clinic. So things like imaging, um, were you making active decisions to not go? Um, we were trying not to, and it would really boil down to would it change our management? And so if it wasn't going to have any effect on whether they were able to play or if, the, if it was going to help with the planning, then we wouldn't go. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we had four hockey players that used it. Um, in the early parts of the tournament, it wasn't too bad. You're able to book a time and they would keep that time. And so you could be in and out. You'd literally book the time then see the orthopedic surgeon they'd go do you want us to assess you or do you want an MRI scan and we'd say we want an MRI scan and then they'd say do you want a report uh or just the CD and we'd say no we don't want a report and so we'd be in and out pretty quick um but towards the end of the tournament it was just chocker with every nation you could imagine and so the risk significantly ramped up and there was quite a long time spent in there um and you could argue the things that we used it for probably didn't make any difference in terms of changing <laughs> management and so to answer chris's question um we thought about it but in the end it probably it probably didn't change how we managed these ones cool um so yeah look thanks for sharing those those thoughts simon and uh it looks like you had a good time still not sure about the singlet but there you go <laughs> um so maybe we'll pass on to you dan um to talk a little bit about prp and and uh some of your thoughts there so um I, I know you haven't got some slides but i guess do you want to give us a quick rundown about what prp is and in, in, in kind of how you use it yeah thanks mark it's always um hard to follow up with the person who's got the nice pictures but this is just me sitting in a room um so look i'm sure many of you are aware of what prp is but just a bit of a, a bit of an overview you take uh you take some blood uh, out of the person and you spin that blood down and you, you're trying to get the platelet fraction out of the blood. Um, that platelet fraction has got lots of growth factors in there which help create um, almost sort of a pseudo positive inflammatory response when I say growth factors you don't, you don't end up regrowing anything um, but you take that, take that blood, spin it down, take the platelet fraction and then you can use uh, that platelet fraction to inject back into that same person uh, and the primary indication for it really now is um, where the real evidence base lies is, is uh, with knee osteoarthritis. Okay, so essentially take the blood, spin it down, make the PRP and stick it back in. That's the sort of idea? That's the idea, yep. And you just, you get a bit of a hand from a, from a kit that gets produced by a manufacturer to help that spinning process and help the separation process. Okay, and so what's the evidence saying about PRP? What's the... Uh... Yeah, so it's, the good thing is that the evidence is increasingly getting better all the time. And so um, it's gone from being something where, yep, maybe it might help and we think this could be a good idea to something where there's a really good solid evidence base supporting its use, uh, particularly and specifically really around knee osteoarthritis. So really nice study came out last year of a, of a meta-analysis of, of 21 randomized controlled trials comparing PRP to cortisone, uh, hyaluronic acid, which some of you might have heard of, which is a copy of the lubricating fluid your knee makes, um, or saline. And um, that clearly showed that, that of those three injections, uh, essentially a placebo, cortisone, or hyaluronic acid, PRP uh, was the most effective at improving people's knee pain um, and improving their function using a couple of outcome scores. And what about, uh, say, tendons and other, other kind of indications? What's the, what's the evidence say there? Yeah, so look, not as, not as strong as it is for, for, your, for your knee arthritis or your knee chondral injuries or uh, potentially some other joints. Um, a, a little bit of, an, of evidence perhaps developing around uh, tennis elbow, um, but not really the evidence base that we're seeing for, for knees where, you know, it could be argued that, 
for some people who've done the hard work, gone through some solid rehab um, and are, uh, are not a surgical candidate, that it, it really should be a key part of people's um, treatment options. Yeah, so um, there's uh, just, I should say there's some questions that have been sent in before from Leanne and others, which um, I'm kind of going to try and throw at you as we go. But um, I guess you mentioned as part of a, a rehab plan, like is, is a PRP injection, is that kind of like a first line treatment in your mind? Is it second line treatment? When, when would you consider talking to a patient about that? Yeah, look, great question. I think that it's, it's part, of a, part of a pyramid, I guess, that I talk to people about. And the, the base of that pyramid is, is, is rehab, uh, a real focus on, on cycling, um, some strengthening work, and look, if possible, in that pyramid, at the base of that pyramid, you're trying to encourage uh, some weight loss. Even a small weight loss can be really helpful for the reduction of knee pain. Um, the tier above that, you might think about simple analgesia. And then that tier above that where, you know, traditionally we've used cortisone. And, and there still is a role for cortisone injections, in my opinion, in this. It's that next tier where PRP comes in. But, you know, many people on the call here will be physiotherapists, so managing people who, who you know, have really given really given it a good go they're already well into that second third tier and so uh, it's a good option at that time so just on that so one of the questions from leanne is around who can refer to us for prp injections you know where what's the process yeah look it's just uh anyone really it's uh same as our normal referral process um i think the expectations uh of the patient should be that We'll certainly discuss it with them. It doesn't mean that everybody who gets referred for PRP is a candidate for PRP, um, but it's something that you'd uh, you know that you'd discuss with uh, with those people. But we'd always talk to them about that suite of options and making sure they know where that sits. Um, it's not a case of turning up having done no work and, and thinking that uh, that's the best first line option for everyone. Um. So Simon's just alluded me to the fact that I've been ignoring all the questions. I was looking at the answered ones, which was really good. Um, so sorry to those of you that we haven't got to some questions yet, but we will come back to them. Um, <laughs> this one from uh, about uh, potential risks associated with PRP injections. So have you got any thoughts about that? I was hoping I'd get to answer some of the Olympics questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, regrettably I, not. I just, just you you could have if you'd gone, but you, you chose not to go. So oh, Thanks for reminding me of that. It's uh, sort of a functioning marriage, which is quite good as a result. Um, the uh, not saying that you don't, Simon. I'm sure you do. Um, so the uh, risks involved. Look, I mean, the risks are theoretically actually less than the risks of the injection of cortisone because you're not injecting a substance that has a has a sort of a minimal immunosuppressive effect. So it's simply a, a very small risk that comes anytime you have a needle penetrate the skin. There's a theoretical risk of infection, but Again, theoretically, that should be less than the one in 15,000 that we, that we quote for cortisone. Um, what we do see sometimes is, is not so much that uh, it, there's a risk of something significant happening, but sometimes people can get a bit of a flare where they get a little bit of extra knee pain, thought perhaps to be because of the white cell count um, that comes with the PRP. Um, but actually, in reality, the, the, the risk is that look, there's a proportion of patients that won't work for, and so perhaps your greatest risk is that you may be a non-responder. Um, I guess those of you who do a bit of reading around knee arthritis will have read that there's sort of a thought there might be multiple phenotypes and perhaps different treatments work better for different phenotypes, and so we haven't really teased that out yet to know who might be better, um, you know, who might be a better candidate based on sort of how they present. Okay. Um, so really good questions coming through here about um when what is there sort of stage or type of arthritis that you would think that prp might be more suitable for yeah it's a good question so look it, it generally works better in people with lower grades um, and it seems to work better in, in medial and lateral compartment pathologies compared to the patellofemoral joint um and generally if you've got a significant alignment issue that's another cohort that probably don't do you know quite as well um but yeah, those sort of grade one and two uh, patients are generally the ones who will do who will do better. Having said that, um, you still see responders if you look at the evidence in those higher grade uh, scenarios. But you know, you're putting them into the mix with all the other options because you know we do have to remember that that 
in some people it might just be, it might not be the right thing for a whole variety of reasons. Um, I guess one of those reasons might be cost. So, um, you know, like I'm aware of, say, for example, stem cells uh, and people going to Australia or at one point going to Australia for a $12,000 stem cell procedure. So what sort of costs would a patient sort of expect to, to pay? Yeah, so look, we, you come to us, it's, it's, it's $600 for, for one injection and it's eight fifty dollars for, for bilateral. So look, that's not, um, you know, that is... That is a reasonable uh, amount of money. I think um, those of us, I guess, those of you who are familiar, I guess, with the way we practice, will recognise that we're, we're, I guess, a relatively conservative bunch. And I think we've got to the place where the evidence base makes us feel comfortable to put this out there a bit more significantly. Um, you know, you, you're really looking at people getting about a, a fifty to sixty percent reduction in their pain and a, uh, a similar improvement the other way in their overall function, lasting anywhere from sort of six to 18 months. And that's, that's what I tell people. But it's one of those things, of course, that if you stand in a room full of 100 people, you'll have a, a, the majority will be happy, but there will be people who it won't respond to. And when you're having that one-on-one -on -one conversation, um, it's all very well to quote the evidence, but if you are the non-responder, uh, the research paper you're talking about is, re is irrelevant to them. They don't care. Mm. Um, and... There's a good question here from Paul about what the research is showing about, is it affecting symptoms or the disease process? What, what do you think PRP is actually doing inside the patient's knee or ankle? Yeah, so I, another great question. I think if you define the disease process as, as being a little bit more complicated than we think, let's be really clear, nothing that was sticking in knees is regrowing hyaline cartilage, and that includes stem cells. And so when I talk to patients about growth factors, I'm really keen to say, look, you know, growing anything but if we recognize that osteoarthritis is not just a process of cartilage disappearing in your knee then we probably are affecting the disease process to some extent um, you know reducing or restoring a, a, an appropriate balance of, of inflammatory growth factors and, and cytokines and the like but I'm really keen to explain to people that you're not regrowing the cartilage but look we know pretty well that your knee doesn't have to look normal to function normally um, you know, you, you, many of you will have driven uh, a Toyota Corolla in your life. And if you lift the bonnet on that, it doesn't look so flash, but it gets the job done. And that's like many a middle-aged knee. And so, um, yeah, I think we are affecting the disease process, but not in that way that if you take a very simplistic view of arthritis as being a cartilage losing sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and there's a couple of questions that are sort of related. Um, one from Mandy about how long you might expect an, an improvement after an injection uh, and then the other one was around how many injections might you want to have so how long do you think you'll get better yeah. from until, yeah. you, until you'll get there yeah <laughs> anything better than that what i tell patients is that the the data the studies usually terminate one year after they start so they show usually out to 12 months an improvement but there's one study I know of that's been published out to five years that showed an improvement. So do you, do you quote studies like that or you just sort of say? Yeah, I do. I, used to, I say that exact same thing, that the, that the improvements are as long as the studies last for and then people wrap up study and move on. But yeah, I normally talk, tell people to, that it's four to six weeks to really see a benefit and then benefits from, you know, out to six to 18 months based on what we've seen in the, in the research. So yeah. Um, and then, just, just the one, just one injection. I think is is the um, the way forward. The the challenge with the PRP research is there's heaps of it, and all just gets melded together into these systematic reviews. But that's also quite reassuring because it's telling us that that it, you know the, the the subtleties of the manufacturing, the way you make it, probably aren't as critical as we think, and the dosing regime may also not be as critical as we thought. Um. And I, I guess I've sort of been answering a few questions just about cost. So um, just to confirm that it's not covered by ACC, they specifically say that this is a treatment they're not covering, but I suspect that that will be reviewed. Um, some private health insurers will pay for the act of the ultrasound guided injection. So they'll cover part of the cost of the procedure, but they don't pay for the cost of the actual kit, which as you can imagine, anything related to health is is prohibitively expensive. So the, the cost is uh, $600 an injection without any insurance coverage, or if people are coming with two body parts, 
um, it's $850, which just reflects the time um, that's taken to prepare it. So um, I think hopefully that answers some of the questions. Um, what about um, big toe arthritis, Dan? A question from Nathan, and also from me, actually. Um, you think you could make my big toes feel better? We could see. Um, yeah, look, once you start going away from the major joints, then I think you have to be a little bit... Um, yeah, I wouldn't probably be where I would initially spend my money if you had a big, big toe problem. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the... the the principles, yep, it might work. Certainly people have noted that hyaluronic acid in very small joints has been useful and with PRP being shown to be clearly superior to that in the knee, you could argue that it might work in the smaller joints. But um, these days I'd be pretty keen to encourage patients who really work hard to sort their knee out to have PRP if they're not winning. If you had a big toe problem, I'd probably want you more to try to twist my arm over the series of consultations where you prove that you've we've really, really exhausted absolutely everything around your footwear choices and Kevlar spring plate, those sorts of things. I think I probably have. Anyway, have we'll, we'll come back to that later, yeah. yeah. Um, so, um, Dan's to, Dan, have you got any personal successes with PRP and tendon problems? So, um, I, I guess just... In, General, there are a few questions about tendons, tendinopathy, um, plantar yeah. fascia pain. Yeah. Um, you've kind of covered a little bit about that, but... Um, yeah, I, I guess people don't... I, I, I assume it means that I have it, I've been jabbing myself, which, which no, I, I have. Suspect, I suspect not. I think your patients. How's no. that going? For you? No. Um, yeah, it doesn't arrest a decline into middle age. Um, yeah, look, it's really interesting because I think we all know very well that the evidence for tendons generally isn't great, but when you do get to situations where you get stuck and, and you choose some patients, you do have success stories. So I've got a, I've got a very clear success story of uh, a number of cases of patella tendinopathy where PRP seems to have worked. Um, patients have pretty much begged me to do it. And so I'm not sure if it's a placebo effect in that regard, but um, that, that's been really helpful. Uh, and that's generally the tendon where I found it's been most helpful because I think it's one of our trickiest tendons to manage. And so perhaps you're seeing a cohort who are struggling more. Um, plantar fascia pain, yeah, haven't used it much there, to be honest. I think the other treatment options that you've got, like radial shockwave therapy, just mean that that's a, a problem where you don't generally have to go down that pathway. But yeah, mainly patella tendons because I think, not necessarily because I think it works there particularly well, but I think because the other treatment options are tricky and it's a tricky tendon um, and it can give people grief for, for quite a while, whereas you can normally get your plantar fascias and your tennis elbows right with some good management. Yeah, so maybe just touching on that, if you're not, if you see a patient and you kind of effectively talk them out of shockwave, oh, not shockwave theory, PRP, would you be talking to them about other sort of modalities like shockwave therapy or? Um... Look, yeah, for plantar fascia pain, absolutely. And I think that, I think we've reached a point now where radial shockwave therapy is no longer, uh, you know, an, an adjunct. I think it's the, one of the mainstays of management of plantar fascia pain. The evidence is strong um, and, you know, it's non-invasive and uh, you turn people around really, really quickly. So you're just not seeing a cohort that are getting to that end stage where they need those other options. So, yeah, big on radial shockwave therapy for plantar fasciitis, smart. Okay, I'm just sending a message to say that yes, we do do it at the clinic. Um, here's a, a question maybe for you, Simon, just if you're still with us, just around um, using PRP in patients that might have had some, um, some form of arth arthroplasty, so it, like a unicompartmental knee. I'm assuming that you wouldn't be a massive fan of that. No, I mean, I guess just the, the act of putting a needle into a knee where, which has got an arthroplasty in situ makes you pretty nervous, but even though that risk of infection is very small, if you've got an artificial joint in there, the consequences are high. Um, and so in, in general, I'm, I'm not an enthusiast of injecting anything, be it cortisone or PRP. Um, certainly it's been done, but I, I'm, never, I'm not aware of any literature on, on success. Um, I can see the, the reasoning behind it. If you had a unicompartmental or maybe some progressive arthritis in the, in the patellofemoral joint or lateral compartment, and you're, you're trying to treat that. 
Um, but, but I think if, if someone's got a painful arthroplasty, you'd be looking for other causes, um, be it loosening of the implant, um, subclinical infection, uh, other reasons why they might be sore uh, with the arthroplasty rather than needing a PRP to treat it. Um, so maybe we'll, we'll start handing over to you, Simon. But Dan, just as a sort of padding, I'm just right trying to raise Simon to answer um, the question about osteopaths, but I've sort of got distracted. But anyway, the, um, the question is just around subgroups of people that might do well with PRP. So you talked about um, different types of knee arthritis in terms of the part of the joint that was involved. What about um, other sort of comorbidities, being male, female, those sorts of things? Is there any evidence about that? Yeah, the problem is, is that once you start to break groups down too much, you start to weaken the evidence. So the best data comes from the biggest pools of things. Um, so, you know, generally it's about the grading and the location that tend to be where that evidence gets split. But I think what we're going to see over the years is that as people better identify these kind of osteoarthritis phenotypes, there's a few studies out there on, on treatments for sort of more bone edema type symptoms that we may find that different subgroups um, you know, tend to tend to show things uh, in, in better responders to, to, to better things. So I think, um, yeah, I think if you've if you had a good crack, you've been doing your biking, you've been doing your strength, and then you try to have a crack at weight loss, you're not a surgical candidate, and you've got sort of mild to moderate osteoarthritis, it's a very reasonable intervention um, these days. And I guess certainly in other places around the world where you're paying for all of your treatment and so you're making a decision based on cost across the board it's it's a pretty accepted um a pretty accepted part of care um it's always jarring in new zealand because we get so well looked after for a lot of our care when you start introducing something that costs right so trying to have that conversation i think is something that that all of us um at times feel uneasy about but i think we can be happy now that the evidence base suggests that it's a reasonable thing to do for that sort of patient great so, okay, well, thanks for that, Dan. Um, we'll hand over to you, Simon. So, yeah, I guess, um, as most of you probably know very well, it's a strange time to be trying to deliver healthcare. Um, hence, we're all sitting in our sheds and living rooms talking about this stuff. But um, Simon is going to talk a little bit about kind of maybe how, how and when we can still access care um, when we're at levels three and four. So I've got a couple of cases and a few sort of experiences to share. So thanks for that, Simon. Thanks, mate. So um, I thought we'd just go a bit about uh, how to assess or what the thoughts that might be going through you in a, you're assessing a new patient with a knee issue via telehealth. And I've now got more, far more experience than I would like to have doing, doing that. But um, even outside of COVID, uh, it's, it's useful, you know, when people, patients are out of town or something you're trying to assess uh, over, the, uh, over a telehealth setup. Um, so I'm just going to mainly try and make it about cases, but I'll, I'll share screen and just go through a couple of slides. Um, on factors that I think are, are useful. Um, that's all shared now. Um, so the, the first thing I guess to think about is um, uh, what, are you, what are you trying to do when you, or what can you do via telehealth and hey, how should your practice be diff different? And there's actually quite a lot of literature on this because around the world, everyone's had to move to telehealth during the COVID period. And the overseas, I guess more so in New Zealand, we were a bit more protected by ACC. There is a... Um, a, a legal risk, I guess, that you're going to you're, you're going to misinterpret signals or um, not pick up something that's serious over telehealth. And there's been lots of cases where that's happened overseas, and the practitioners have gotten in trouble. So I think some three rules for it. One is review early, so bring them back sooner than the perhaps you otherwise would. So that way, if you miss something on the first go, you, you might be more likely to pick it up on the on the second time. Second is refer earlier. Um, you know, the, the pathways are still open, medical care even at level four is available. Um, so if, you, if you're worried, if you're sitting on the fence, I think here on the side of referring early. And thirdly, have a lower threshold for imaging because that's, that's the, when you look at medical legal cases that have come up overseas in the last 12 months over, over COVID period, a lot of it was choosing not to investigate. So not ordering an ultrasound for a DVT and then patient gets a PE. Um, just in not ordering an x-ray when there was a, a fracture that then becomes harder to treat later. So um, I think if you're thinking about something and wondering whether you should get a test again, I think ordering a test uh, via telehealth early and is, is a better strategy. Um, things to pick up from the history when you're, when you're asking about a knee, and most of the, the, the defining you know, whether somebody's a high risk for a serious problem with the, with the knee is, is about the history more, about, more than about the exam. And, and you can do that pretty well over, over telehealth as well as in person. 
Firstly, think of the mechanism, you know, try and think how much force has been applied to this knee. You know, what's the likelihood that something serious has happened? Uh, far, you know, if they've fallen down from a height or if they just tripped going uh, down, down a, a small step on the flat or, or into the gutter. Um, could they continue or play on? Not many people are going to be playing much at the moment, but um, could they continue what they're doing? And I'm still seeing people now who obviously injured a couple of weeks ago skiing or otherwise um, before the lockdown. Um, immediate swelling, uh, you know, if it swells up immediately, you're worried about blood. If it smells up, swells up later, you're more worried about just a reaction of fusion. So that, that history of swelling is, is useful. But most of the, I find a lot of patients are not very good at remembering, you know, how long it swelled up. They weren't really watching the timing, how long the swelling took to occur. Um, and hearing a crack or a pop is, is generally bad. Um, and, and patients are often pretty reliable at hearing that, saying they heard a noise. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the things that you can, can get from a telehealth examination, and, and there's not many, but I think you can get some pretty key points. Firstly, can they weight bear? You know, are they, are they on crutches or not? You know, weight bearing is a pretty good sign uh, that they're unlikely to have a major fracture and they're unlikely to have a major ligament injury. Um, there's always exceptions to every rule, but it's a, it's a pretty reassuring sign to see them weight bear and equally a worrying sign if they're not. Um, have they got a bigger fusion? And it's pretty... You, you're not going to pick up a subtle infusion over telehealth, but you can, and I'll show you a slide in a minute from a telehealth consult that I screenshotted, uh, where you can see that there's a larger fusion and a larger fusion would make you worry. Secondly, range of motion, you can, you can do a full exam uh, of extension and flexion with the knee, unlike other joints, and, and I think that provides good information. And then lastly, straight leg raise. You know, can they, can they straight lift their leg up straight? And really all you're trying to do here is pick up uh, even if it's of an extensive mechanism much uh, rupture. And I sort of put, highlight those four things and I really think that you, you don't need to do much more, like trying to do anything more or ligament exams or anything or giving the patient a twist or turn to do a meniscal test. It's, it's just not going to be rewarding. Um, so I think you're better off uh, keeping it limited to what you can examine over the knee and patients have got pretty variable um, internet connections and camera and always when I ask them to point their phone at the knee I end up looking at their groin or their foot it's it's you, you do what you can um, and really that's a, why I say be more defensive about this because it, it is definitely true that your exam is going to be limited um, over telehealth um, this is just an example of a, of a case with, a, with an effusion on the right side this is about the what you can pick up you know a really large effusion versus not the other side and I find this is quite good as well um, to ask the patient to show you both knees because it puts the camera back further I always find people bring the camera too close when they're sending you pictures or, or showing a video. If you tell them to put, get both knees in, it forces them to put the camera further away. Um, so rather sort of talking about it, I thought I'd just go through some cases. Uh, in, the, in the first case we've got, it's actually a case from this, this week um, that Mark and I looked after. Uh, I still haven't met this person, uh, but, but we've, I feel we've given her a pretty good um, treatment effectively through, through a telehealth scenario. Um, so she's 62, she's fitting well, she's a, she's a GP here on the shore. Uh, she had a skiing injury uh, about 10 days ago. Uh, she fell over, thought the injury wasn't too bad, but tried to ski down and the knee gave out. Uh, so she had to get help down the mountain. Uh, she's had no previous injuries. Um, the exam and all you could do really over the telehealth was to look and say there was a large effusion. She's unable to wait there, but she could straight leg raise. And that's all really that we aim for over a telehealth exam. Can you do those things? Um, and a range of motion was a bit limited. She'd had an X-ray uh, and this X-ray came up pretty normal. Um, and the lateral view here is, uh, is the one that I sort of want to show you. Um, and the main things to highlight here is firstly that it's a horizontal X-ray. So they've taken it uh, with the patient um, lying down. And the reason they do that is to show you this. And that fl fat fluid level, the life is evidence of a lipo hemarthrosis. So something has bled with fat into the knee. And that generally means that there's a fracture, something's broken. Um, you could maybe be fooled if, if there was a, um, a big ligamese injury with a lot of blood in the knee joint. But, but here, when you see that sign, you're thinking that there's blood in the knee and you're immediately suspicious that there's a fracture somewhere. And then trying to look here, it's pretty subtle to pick up, but on the X-ray, you can see uh, there's a little bit of bone there that's, that shouldn't be, um, in, which is sitting in the intercolonal notch. You actually couldn't see it at all on the, on the plane film, uh, on the, sorry, the AP film, but on the lateral here, you're suspicious. But even, even if you couldn't see this, the presence of that uh, hemarthrosis would, would make you think that this, this needs investigating further, either with a CT scan or, or an MRI scan. Um, the other things I think to pick up from the history uh, here is that she tried to ski down, but she get the knee gave out. So in effect, this is she couldn't play on. She couldn't continue what she was doing. The knee, something serious is wrong with the knee. 
and the large effusion, again, a sign that something's bled, um, and the inability to wait there. All, all sort of alarm bells that this, this needs referred early, it needs investigating early with, with high tech imaging. Um, just to show you sort of what, what the imaging showed. Uh, so this is a, a sagittal view of the, um, of the knee. The ACLs intact there, you sort of see the low signal fibers, but the base of it where it attaches to the tibia um, has evolved. And you can see it maybe a bit better on the T2 images where, where the fluid shows as white. So you can see that fluid signal underneath that bony fragment that's, a, that's evolved. Um, and this pretty unusual injury for a 62 year old, much more common in younger people. So it's just a, it's a variant of, a, um, of an ACL injury. And in this setting, you know, in a 62 year old with a mid-substance mid ACL rupture, you'd, even someone who was active in skiing, you'd certainly be leading them towards a non-operative pathway first, um, or at least a trial of that. But in this setting, because that fragment's large and it's also gonna impinge when she's trying to extend, and the healing's pretty good when you get bone to bone healing. So generally you wanna to get to these and put the bit of bone back and, and repair it, either arthroscopically with some sutures tunneled through the bone or, or with some screws. Um, and so she's, she's having that operation tomorrow, uh, coming into North Shore, and we were, we're still, still doing acutes. We've stopped doing any elective surgery, but our acutes are open and uh, up and running. In fact, we're far better than usual because we've got a lot of surgeons sitting around ready to work. Um, so yeah, she's coming so, in tomorrow. So Simon, just a, a couple of questions on uh, this case, but also you know the other cases you've got too. But um, any advice about trying to access imaging at the moment? Well, you I mean it's it's a you can right like it's it's there and available, and uh, all the radiology practices in Auckland are open, and you know it's, it's people can be harmed if you're not going to if you, if you can't diagnose them after after an injury. So I don't think you need to feel uh, abashed if you see someone who's or bashful about if you see someone who's had an injury and you're worried they they need that investigated, um, and and that's appropriate at level four. Um, and I mean I, I guess for chronic more chronic pains, things like that, it's, it's, you, you might defer the imaging, but um, in, in these sort of settings, I think you need to investigate aggressively, even if you're planning to treat conservatively. So yeah. you know what you're dealing with, because it might be a while before you're going to be able to see that person uh, in clinic. So I think it would be worth noting that um, the, the accessing imaging uh, this time around is a little bit more challenging or uh, is a little bit harder than it was last time around. And there is some variance between practices. So um, as a rule, anything that is acute and determined to require treatment within two weeks, most, I think all radiology practices are doing that. So if you're seeing people where you are thinking about recording or investigating early, as Simon was suggesting, it's really important that you articulate that on your referral, otherwise the patient won't get the imaging. So if it's someone uh, like Dan's patient that has osteoarthritis and they've had it for a while, obviously that's something that should be deferred. Um, but Simon's absolutely right. If things are acute and you deem a level of urgency, the radiology practices will still do it. Um, and then certainly if we're seeing patients like this one, I see some, uh, there is some feedback about how we've got the MRI scans. Well, actually for these acute patients where there is a problem like this that is time sensitive or the patient's in pain and taking over your talk, Simon, um, we can still actually, we can still get this, this imaging and it is going to do more harm, I think, leaving it. And as per last time out, the, the radiology practices have quite robust processes around longer appointment times, taking patients out of the waiting room, leaving them in the car, getting them through quickly. Um, so that I think is a, an important thing to realize. Yeah. Um, I noticed a question there about um, uh, trying try to do meniscal tests, any uh, thesis sign or, or any other meniscal tests. Um, I don't think there's any harm in doing that at all um, it, it, over telehealth. Um, I mean, even in practice, though, when I'm examining people, the, the, the test that's got the most sensitivity and specificity for a meniscal tear is joint line tenderness. And obviously, you can't do that over telehealth. So I, I think as a, as a substitute, you know, those tests um, is, a, is a reasonable thing to do. Um, it, you know, it might sort of help give you some advice on, on what you think the diagnosis is. Um, so next case... Um, this is an 18 year old fit and well, and I'm trying to line these cases up to ones that you that might get in tr get you into trouble if you're trying to examine them over, over telehealth, you know, things that you may not want to miss. Um, he twisted his knee playing in the backyard, he's unable to play on. Examining him, he's got no effusion, it's reassuring. He's able to wait there again, reassuring, but he's got restricted range of motion, 15 to 100 degrees. Um, and he's had an X-ray, uh, which was reported as normal. 
Um, but the, the key thing here is that he can't fully extend the knee. And the rest of the history is pretty benign, you know, not, not a severe injury. Um, couldn't play on, but, but still able to wait there, no big effusion. Um, but the fact that they can't get full extension is a worry, right? You're worrying that there's something rocked. The, if somebody's got a large effusion, a hemarthrosis from an ACL, often they can't get full extension. So that's not maybe not truly a locked knee, and it's hard to get that in, into context. And sometimes it's really hard to tell the difference. But um, if somebody can't get the knee out fully straight, then the, a displaced meniscal fragment should be in the back of your mind. Um, and is, is this an acute locked knee? And it's, it's time critical but maybe not needing to be go to straight to hospital that day so it is maybe the one if you're not sure um, you might rehab for a few days and bring back for an early review check again maybe when they've got it out straight you'd be reassured um, I don't think you'd harm them by doing that um, but what we're looking for here is that posterior horn and meniscus is flipped forward and is blocking it and the CV with a normal position of that meniscus would be sitting back and this is you, you want to get to this soon for two reasons one the longer the knee's stuck the, the more greater the chance it's going to lose permanently some extension uh, but the second reason is the chance of repair of getting that back into position and putting it back where it came from is higher uh, if you've got that um, earlier surgery op opportunity to get it back. So this is something that we would bring in to North Shore Hospital under, or into, into the public hospital under level four um, to, to operate on, uh, particularly because right now we're not really doing anything in private um, elective surgery under ACC. So this, this is one that if, we, if it was picked up and diagnosed, we would aim to bring it in in the next week or two to, to be treated in, in the public system. And again, there's a, there's a patient like this on tomorrow on our acute list having, having this done. Um, how long have we got, Mark? Time for us? You got one more case, I reckon. One more case. Um, well, that's all one of the question and answers. This is, this is maybe quite a, quite a good one for that. So uh, this is a 54-year-old fit well truck driver, slipped on the carpet, pain in his knee, no previous injuries. Um, on examination, no, no big effusion, uh, able to wait there, so he's walking around, um, but he can't straighten his grass. That was, the, that was the finding on the, on the exam. He couldn't lift the knee up. So otherwise, sort of pretty benign history here. It's just a small injury. He's able to walk. He's not a big effusion in the knee, um, but, but can't, can't do a straight raise when you examine him. The, the x-ray here, I don't know if you can see over, over the uh, connection, uh, there's a small little bit of fragment of bone here, but it looks very rounded, right? You'd look at that and think that was chronic. Um, being there a long time. It doesn't really look like an avulsion fracture. So the, these x-rays are actually reported as normal uh, with a bit of sign of, of quadriceps tendinopathy. So you would have got the report back from these and, and not been particularly worried and maybe gone through a rehab pathway. Um, but the fact that they couldn't straightly raise, it's got to raise your antennae that there's either a patella tendon rupture or quadriceps rupture. Um, and and that's, that's, this is something that needs, needs treated urgently. And, and at least a couple of times a year, I'll still see people who've had this injury, injury missed um, because it, it is easy to miss those other signs. Most of the time it is, you know, people can't wait there. That's a big injury and there's other things sort of raising your antennae uh, that it needs investigation and early scan. Um, but there, there are people who come in surprisingly mobile with, with a quad rupture. Uh, more so, I think, than patella tendon rupture. That's a bit more... Um, traumatic uh, and often in usually younger patients but um, older, older patients here often with cause rupture can be surprisingly functional and it's only if you remember to do that straightly raised test that you pick it up uh, and pick up this problem and not miss it um, especially over, over tally health. Cool um, so look thanks a lot for that Simon I think it's a it's a challenging time isn't it so the knee um, we could kind of extrapolate that out to pretty much any musculoskeletal problem so um, I think it's really important to think about what are those things that you don't want to miss. Um, it was a great question. I, I should have asked you before, but I hadn't, uh, I hadn't noticed the questions coming through. Simon Baker was around what, what were the consequences of a, a positive test? So if you'd had a, a positive test in the hockey team, what would that have meant to the hockey team? Yeah, I had replied to Gavin. Hi, Gavin. Thanks for the question. We've worked together briefly in hockey. So uh, ba basically, it would be the end of the Olympics. Unfortunately, there is there were a couple of potential mitigating factors. So there was uh, any positive COVID test became the Japanese public health system's issue, but there was a separate group set up um, to go into potential mitigating issues that could help manage that. So, if you had had both vaccines, if you had stuck to your activity plans, uh, had negative daily saliva tests. Um, and done everything else then theoretically you may be able to return to the olympics sooner than a predetermined set of time 
but for most people that probably wouldn't be quick enough uh, to have any any real meaningful effect on the Olympics unless you tested positive perhaps in the beginning and then we're, uh, we're, we're in a team like hockey and went deep in the tournament you might get away with it. Yeah and are you aware of any uh, close calls for New Zealand athletes? Yes uh, so I'm aware of uh, some being close contacts um, just by virtue of their seats on airplanes um, through no fault of their own. Uh, so some athletes had to spend as a close contact their time in isolation in the New Zealand Olympic um, accommodation. So they basically were only allowed out of their room to train and compete. So they had to eat in their room. And uh, so they didn't have a normal experience, but thankfully there wasn't too many of them. Cool. So um, there are, there's probably another couple of minutes if oh, there's a few questions still coming through. So um, with extra time on our hands, any suggestions of good podcasts to listen to? Um, absolutely. I am deep into the Peter Crouch podcast. Has anyone uh, listened to that? So it's a football podcast. It's just all levels of buffoonery that um, while I'm out trying to run around the block, it makes me laugh out loud. Um, fortunately, the mask contains some of that. Yeah, Rose, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so yeah, Peter Crouch podcast, if you haven't seen it, if you like sort of sport and banter and football, it's a good one. Um, there's probably about five series to catch up on. Um, any podcasts for you, Simon or well, Simon? Well, maybe they're talking about medical ones. Oh yeah. I'm not so interested about that. BJSM, it's a good podcast, but and I think for me, I, I think they did. There we go for medical there, Mark. But... Yeah, um, <laughs> Ross Tucker, the science of sport one is, oh, a, good yeah, one. That is good. a deep dive into all things that will never get resolved. Like you know, testosterone levels and running shoes and that kind of thing. Yeah, so that, that is a legitimately good one. Um, anything, I mean, I guess, um, uh, Simon, <laughs> lost my train of thought completely. It's very I'll, I'll give it for, a, for another, another buffoonery sports one. The alternative cricket commentary has got all five days of the New Zealand's Triumph and the World Test Championship uh, available on their podcast. So if it's a long lockdown, you can listen to that whole five days. <laughs> A lot of it's rain. That does sound pretty good. So, look, I guess maybe we'll, we'll wrap it up there. If we're talking about rubbish podcasts, um, we probably <laughs> have just about expanded our, 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 our uh, session. So, just uh, if we are still in this situation, we're going to roll out another podcast, not podcast, but we could make a podcast. No, don't want to make a podcast. Um, another webinar this time next week. Um, and uh, I guess for those of you that are working out in telehealth or, or having a break, I hope everyone's good. I hope everyone's uh, thinking about getting vaccinated and staying away from other people. Um, and just, I guess, a, a final reminder that we are working as well. So if you want to send some patients through, particularly these acute type of patients, we're um, ready and able to see them. And uh, like last time, we've set up some acute clinics with our, with our team so we can get patients in quickly. So um, we don't have the normal uh, wait time. So if patients do want to send people through, um, that's good. Um, maybe just a last question, any tips for manual therapists looking to work more with teams or I guess for anyone wanting to get to the Olympics, Simon, um, have you got any tips or, or uh, suggestions about how you might get there as part of the support staff? Uh, I mean, I think you just have to sink your teeth in and get involved. So you have to build your CV, build your experience. Um, there's lots of opportunities if you want to get out there. There's teams begging to have that extra help. And I think that's what it would boil down to. Uh, you need to get that experience and then prove you can be a valuable member to the team. I know there are lots of elite athletes that certainly use those practitioners. And so the, the more you're out there, the more chance there will be. Cool. All right, look, um, hopefully it was useful, guys. I hope for, uh, hopefully it's also filled an hour of your time uh, rather than, I don't know, um, Netflix or Disney Plus for you, Dan. Um, and we'll look forward to catching you next week. Thanks, everyone. See ya. Take care.